Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Chris Lancaster and I'm Assistant Curate in the Parish of St Andrew in Brighton and it's my privilege to be your MC this morning for this conversation on the subject, The Better City, Sustainable Living in Urban Australia. And so it's good to be having this conversation right in the heart of this great city, Melbourne. And joining the Archbishop for this morning's conversation are Professor Ros Hansen and Lord Mayor Robert Doyle. Ros Hansen is an urban and regional planner with more than 30 years experience working both in Australia and the Asia Pacific region. Ros has expertise and skills in strategic planning at the local, regional and national levels. Master planning of existing urban centres undergoing substantial growth as well as new towns formulation of urban management systems and techniques underpinned by sustainable development principles and practices, and stakeholder and community consultation processes, and training of professionals in urban and regional planning approaches and practices. And Lord Mayor Robert Doyle has been Lord Mayor of Melbourne since his election in 2008 and re-election in 2012. He's a principal at management consultancy, the Naus Group, and since 2007 has been chairman of Melbourne Health, which runs the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He's the president of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, chairman of the Royal Melbourne Hospital Foundation, and a trustee of the Shrine of Remembrance, as well as holding office for numerous other charitable and community organisations. Archbishop, I hand over to you to begin our conversation for this morning. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, everyone. It's a lovely, bright morning, isn't it? It's nice to have uh, moved through that uh, dark spot of the early winter mornings where we've, uh, we haven't been here. But, Ros, but first, can I, I ask you something? Uh, we, I guess most of us here would think that planning is something that needs... Um, well, a lot of consistency, if you want to achieve something, you've got to build on an idea that continues for a period of time, and most infrastructure is fairly expensive and costly to build. Uh, you're involved in, in the Plan Melbourne approach, but um, uh, tell us the differences that you had with the implementation of that that meant you, you left that, uh, that work. Where do I start? Um, <coughs> yes, yeah, so planning is a long-term vision exercise. And I think for a lot of people that's very difficult uh, to understand and perhaps to look in a 20 or 30 year horizon. So it's quite challenging and you have to make certain assumptions um, and hope that those assumptions uh, through time actually deliver. Um, but also planning has to be pretty adaptable. In terms of the implementation side of things, um, I've become a great believer in doing a lot at the community or neighbourhood level. I think that we really underestimate the power of people in terms of uh, changing their neighbourhoods but for the better, uh, being able to green their neighbourhoods, being able to be more participatory in the future and the destiny of their neighbourhoods. So in the context of Plan Melbourne, I don't think we actually explored that opportunity of using the community and the neighbourhood as a major resource. And I think that's somewhat disappointing because I do believe there's many communities out there that have a real appetite to be involved in those sorts of very grassroots activities that really do make a better place to live. Um, in the wider context of implementation, we all know that we live in a user pay system. And we will need to come to terms with that because increasingly the infrastructure that we require will require us to put our hands deeper into our pockets. And there are fairness and equity issues that are associated with that where there are an increasing number of people who are unable to pay. So we need to take that into account. But implementation is about having a pipeline of projects and a sequence of projects that all add value, not only economic value but social and environmental value. And I think that one of the difficulties I have with Plan Melbourne is that there's an emphasis on very large projects such as the East West Link which suck up a lot of very valuable resources and there are many, many other projects across metropolitan Melbourne that in my opinion are far more important that may not come to fruition for up to a decade. I was just asking that because it seems uh, just in, in our earlier conversations that there's um, uh, a lot of compromise needed in 
uh, being able to engage in this space. And Robert, I, I know that you've been a, a reluctant supporter of some of the high-rise developments. I'm interested in exploring at the moment, I suppose, you know, where, where we find uh, points of compromise between what would be ideal and then the realities. Just talk us through some of your, your thinking and changes of your views on that. We see it at the pointy end because when these developments are mooted, even if we're not the so-called responsible authority, <coughs> where the minister is the authority, we still give advice on it at the city. And so any member of the public can come and stand up and present their views to us and, and we'll take those into account. So we hear very directly from the community. Here's our difficulty. I'm not a believer in Melbourne, Melbourne continuing to grow at the edges. I think we've done that for far too long. And I think that has created the ghettos of the future, to be honest. And, and it's given us some awful planning outcomes. Um, one that, that just appalls me is in Point Cook, uh, that has the highest level of induced births in Australia. Why? Because if you live in Point Cook, it takes you an hour to get onto the freeway and then an hour from the freeway to the hospital. <coughs> and many doctors won't take that risk for their patients. Now, that, that's an appalling statistic, but it's because a whole suburb was put down where there wasn't sufficient infrastructure, particularly public transport infrastructure, to support the movement from home to employment. So if we don't believe that Melbourne should continue to just grow outwards and, and get bigger and bloated in that way, then we're going to have to get denser. Because I think the big thing facing us is population growth. And I, I don't know whether we're going to be a city of 6 million or 7 million or 8 million, but its implications for how we live and where we live are, are tremendous and, and how we move around and where work is. So to bring it back to Philip's point, when some of these very tall towers are put before us at the city, and let me tell you, I, I talk about art mimicking life. I was watching the wonderful Utopia the other night, <laughs> Rob Sitch's Utopia. And a developer told Rob Sitch, this is an iconic development. And he said, it's not iconic, it's just big. Well, that's exactly what I said in, in council about a month before, so I'm gonna get Sitch for the rights to that phrase. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make is this. If we don't want the city to continue to grow outwards, and I think Ros and I agree on most things, I'm not sure if we agree on this one. I think the infill movement, where there was density in suburban streets, has also taken a backlash. Well then, what's the option or the alternative for getting those extra people in while maintaining livability? And to me it is greater density along existing infrastructure like rail lines and tram lines and major roads. And where we can take it, and the city is an example, towers that are really vertical communities. And, and that's the trade-off for not spreading further and further. And if we do that, we've done the work to demonstrate that we could get an extra maybe 2, 2.3 million people into Melbourne without building that extra infrastructure by using existing infrastructure better and leaving probably 94% of suburban Melbourne untouched, then we're going to have to compromise when it comes to tall towers, for instance, in the CBD and in South Bank and probably partly in Fisherman's Bend so that we can have good results elsewhere. Mind you, that's not endless. And I think in places well, like South Bank, we're coming to well, the end of that. Perhaps look a bit, a little bit later at some of those <coughs> principles you're enunciating there. I suppose I just wanted to, at the, at the moment to focus on the confidence we can have that we can actually get uh, the best minds applying thought and um, strategic thinking to planning and for that planning to survive electoral cycles and uh, other things. So um, I guess we've seen there's been a long policy with the green wedges in the greater Melbourne area and government decisions can be made to open that up to residential subdivision. So, you know, fundamentally a very long-term plan about how the city might develop, you know, can be changed by, uh, by a political decision. Uh, what do you think, Ros, are some of the, the worst of those things that, that we have done that possibly now we just can't reverse? Oh, um, look, I think in terms, of, in terms of the Yarra River, I mean, I don't think we would, have, we would build the Monash Freeway or what is, used to be called the South Eastern Freeway if we were looking at it today. 
Um, I think back in the, the 60s, we really didn't value the river frontage. It was the back door. It wasn't the front door. Mm. So um, I doubt whether we'd do that today, whether in fact we would uh, take one of the major natural resources, uh, which is also a, a recreation resource, mm. and put a barrier there as substantial as a freeway. Um, so I think we would have done that differently um, today than perhaps you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, I think the other thing too in terms of mistakes, um, look, I mean, Melbourne has a terrific legacy of successes. Mm. Um, and so therefore, you know, the mistakes are, are very um, minimal uh, in my view. However, I am concerned about the greenfields, mm. but I'm more concerned about the social consequences of greenfield development apart from the environmental. And I think that one of the mistakes that we're making is that we are saying to people, go out to the greenfields, it's affordable. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is not affordable. It is not affordable living because many of those families are commuting long distances to access work and basic services. Um, also, the housing increasingly in the greenfield environment is not that affordable. We've got a growing number of mortgage defaults out there as well as family breakups because of the economic pressures that they're under. So. I think that one of the mistakes that we're making is the way that we're delivering the green fields in that we're not actually providing jobs and we're not providing basic community building services in the green fields and we're saying for people, bad luck, you're just going to have to wait. I can remember the days when we put railway corridors down in paddocks and the people came. Now what we do is we send the people out there and we procrastinate about whether we're going to provide them with basic access. And I think that's incredibly unfair, and I think it's having real consequences. That is a mistake. And it's a big social public cost, that mistake. Robert, you've been on the, the inside of many political discussions. Uh, you know, I suppose cast yourself back to your life in the in, uh, state parliament. Uh, what are I'd the prefer kind of... not to, if you don't mind. Well, like to just, just <laughs> for the no, sake of a, helping it's us. It's an old know. wound. I'd rather not reopen it, but just for <laughs> you, I will. You're uh, a generous man. <laughs> just, just cast yourself back for our benefit. What's, what's the kind of... Uh, you know, when, we're, when, when people who are at the end, the decision makers about these things are considering them, uh, how, how much is, is that expert advice, long-term plans, you know, weighed up against <laughs> some... Well, again, the iconic thing that could be put forward as what our, what our government, you know, what our proposal is going to achieve. How do, they, how do they tend to balance up? Well, they don't balance very well at all, is the, is the answer to it. I mean, and believe me, you can find expert opinion that will just about confirm any yes. public policy that you, you wish to promulgate. Um, can I also say I, I agree at 100 miles an hour with what Ros just said. I, I think it's our biggest mistake. And, and I'll, I'll come to that in the context mm -hmm. of your question. Think about the huge growth down in Wyndham, you know, because it's affordable housing, okay? Problem is, as, as Ros said, it's not close to public transport and it's not close to employment. So people jump in their cars and they jump on that freeway and they drive over the Westgate Bridge to come into the city where the work is. There's a breakdown on the Westgate, traffic banks back for 25 kilometres, it's chaos. So we suddenly say, we need a second crossing to duplicate the Westgate at $6 billion. Well, suddenly it's not such affordable housing after mm. all, even in financial terms, much less the social and community terms that, that Ros put. I think the problem with state governments is, I think it is the electoral cycle. I think now, I, I don't think we are in an era anymore where we'll have very, very long-term governments. If you win government now, I reckon the most you've got is probably 10 years. You know, we have an impatience with, with longer than that. And so think about that in state terms. You're elected for the very first time <coughs> and you're immediately thinking, win the next election. Because that's probably all you've got. You've probably got eight years. If you're very lucky, you might get another one. So a lot of this thinking is driven by, by short-term thinking, not the 25 to 40 year thinking that Ros was talking about with public infrastructure. And to be honest, there's also huge pressure from people. You know, it's not as if those houses are lying empty in Wyndham or, or out in Casey. You know, they, they aren't. But they're just not very affordable. To come back to your earlier question, those units, you know, you can get a one or a two bedroom unit in those towers in the city for between 320 and probably 450,000. That's still a lot of money. But try buying a house for that anywhere in Melbourne. So in terms of affordability, that, that's where the affordability it is, hence, hence the drivers. 
But I think, you know, people think that, that politics is scientific and rational. It's, <laughs> let, let, me, let me explode that myth for you. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. It is intensely human. And if you're the planning minister, really what you're thinking is, this is an economic portfolio, and yes, it's about the way we live, but it's also about the economy. And that's a tension that is very mm. difficult to reconcile for a planning minister. If there aren't those cranes in the sky, then believe me, the economy does start to grind to a halt. And that's an important consideration as well. You know, we, we worry about job security. We worry about the, you know, the manufacturing sector. You know, if we lost every single automotive manufacturing job, including componentry in Victoria, we would lose 24,500 jobs. In the last six years, in the central city alone, we have added 77,500 jobs. And they're in areas like construction and real estate and building and green building and biotech and green tech and hospitality and health services. But that is the knowledge workforce that wants to live in those towers and walk to work. And by the way, that's where the employment generator is for our next generation of young people. So they're the sort of tensions that you're thinking of as you're making these decisions. The other part is, I think, as you go to Spring Street in Canberra, you get more distant from people and communities. And, and I think that's sometimes very, very difficult. It's worse in Canberra, but that's not much comfort. I've learned a lot by being in local government and sitting and listening to how a particular development will affect people's lives. And I don't mean that in a selfish, nimby way. I mean it as quite proper concern voiced about their street, their suburb, their community. And, and you've got to listen to that. But that voice is hard to hear from Spring Street. Well, let's turn now to, uh, to a big canvas, which uh, I think, Robert, you've said we're in the middle of one of the biggest urban renewal experiments in the world, the over 600 hectares, including South Bank Docklands, Fishman's Bend and Eagate. Um, this is a big, a big canvas, uh, some of it just about built out. I think South Bank about 90%, Docklands about 50% built through, but still a big canvas. How, what are we going to do to get that big canvas right? Ros, give us your... Well, views on, on what's, our, what's our forward direction there? Well, I think, I mean, Fisherman's Bend to me is a huge exercise. It's about four times the size of the hodl grid, if, correct me if I'm right. wrong, Rob, but That's it's right. huge. Um, and that is a, um, a significant piece of uh, a land resource that's going to take many, many years, uh, decades upon decades to actually complete. I think you need a plan that creates distinctiveness, diversity, uh, creates communities, not one community, but many communities. You obviously want a place that's mixed use, and I think we need to come to terms with that, that there's, Jane Jacobs in the 60s said something that was so profound, but now to me is just so obvious, that increased density and mixed use support more services and create more local jobs and enhance walking, cycling, and the use of public transport. They are the planks of building the Fisherman's Bend, that if you actually look at all of those things, mixed use, some density, some services, the jobs, and the public transport and the way to move around, that will make that a very successful place. The concern I have about Fisherman's Bend, and I've recently written an article about it for the Planning News Journal, is I don't get a sense of a real vision when I look at the plan. I actually don't get a sense that this is a number of neighbourhoods. I just get a sense that this is a high to medium high rise residential area with maybe a sprinkling of jobs if we're lucky. And that is very concerning because we don't want to see that opportunity frittered away because we didn't plan it properly. So when you plan, you've got to plan the big picture, mm. but you've also got to plan the detail. And at the moment, I don't think the big picture is really going to deliver on what we require at the detailed level, and that is very concerning. Um, the infrastructure is going to be challenging in Fisherman's Bend. Uh, if we can't get a decent uh, tram connection, uh, back to the central city, I think that that's a lost opportunity. But at the same token, Rob, I somewhat disagree with you about the high rise. Can I ask how many of you in this room live in an apartment building higher than 10 storeys? 
Okay. How many of you would want to live in the central city if you could afford it? Okay, so you see, we've probably got a third, if not less, in this room of people who high-rise living and living in the city isn't necessarily their journey of life. And I think this is the problem with Fisherman's Bend, that if we want to get family accommodation in there, we have to build buildings which are suitable for families. Families do not live in two-bedroom apartments on the 29th floor of a 50-storey skyscraper. They might in New York, but they don't in Melbourne and they won't for a long time. It's a very sophisticated way of living and it requires a lot of trade-offs and I don't think a lot of families are quite in that headspace. So the skyscrapers serve a certain need, but Fisherman's Bend has to create the diversity of housing or else we won't have a mixed community. We won't have a socio-economic mixed community. We won't have an ethnically diverse community. We'll just have more of the same and that really worries me. That's not reasonably gloomy though, isn't it? It's, it's almost like we're painting a picture of one of this, this big blank canvas that we're almost all going to be back here uh, in 30 years' time and uh, saying lost opportunity. That, well, that's that's well, I hope, pretty discouraging. I hope, well, I hope not. I mean, I hope that we actually get some good residential product mm. in Fisherman's Bend and a sense of community and a sense of identity that isn't just about super towers and high-rise towers. But that's all that's being approved at the moment. Every application virtually that's gone through in the last six months in Fisherman's Bend is the tall tower syndrome. And I can tell you, for many Melburnians, that's not where they want to be. It's not the lifestyle they choose. It's not what they can afford. And I think we need to wake up to ourselves. So Robert, what's your, um, what's your take on the, the big blank canvas which uh, we've got before us and we're going to have before us for <coughs> many years? Look, I, I agree with much of, of what Ros said there. And in, and in Fisherman's Bend, for instance, I think that higher density and that higher tower stuff should be down towards the city. And as Fisherman's Bend moves back towards South Melbourne, it, it should take a, a very dramatic drop in, in height and density to then blend with that traditional older suburb. And, and that's sort of my, my big view of it with, with the public transport going in there which, by the way, I don't think is a tram which rises out of the water at Freshwater Place, travels up over the freeway and then drops down. I, you know, sorry. I, just, I think it's spectacular. I, yeah, yeah, good on you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, just like can't, I just can't see that one, one happening. Um, look, let, 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 me, let me answer this, and I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass Roz here, um, which will give me great pleasure. Um, when, when I was a young member of Parliament, gee, I thought I was smart. You know, I was so clever. I thought I was the cleverest bloke in the room. And, and then as I got a bit older, I started to panic because I realised that wasn't the case and who was going to solve these problems for us. And, and then as I got a few more years on me, I started to relax again because you get to the point where you recognise that there is wisdom and, and there is experience and there is deep knowledge in, in our very talented community here. And people like Roz uh, are a part of that pool of talent. So the answer is you listen to people like Roz Hansen and, and my... Uh, guiding star here is Professor Rob Adams at the City of Melbourne, who for 30 years has guided the, the fine grain as well as the big picture development of our city. And, and you need to have the confidence to stand back and say, you know what, if I listen carefully to the people who really do have that combination of big picture wisdom and small grain expertise, then I can't go too far wrong. But you need to have the confidence to do that. And, and it's taken me a long time to land there. But when I became Lord Mayor, that's, that's sort of what happened to me. You might recall, you know, Swanson Street used to be neither fish nor fowl. It was open to public transport and, and cyclists and pedestrians during the day and then opened to private vehicles at night. You know, it, it was, we'd fiddled with Swanson Street for 40 years. Mm. And I, I was elected on a platform of opening it up to private traffic. And when I arrived at the city of Melbourne, Rob Adams sort of got hold of me quickly and said to me, don't do that, here's why. And he demonstrated to me a very simple maxim. Great streets make great cities. Mm. And if you can create the things that Ros was talking about in a street, don't worry, bit by bit, mm. year by year, decade by decade, it will add up. And so I flipped 180 degrees and, and I was prepared to close Swanson Street 
to private vehicles. You'll still see delivery vehicles and emergency vehicles in there, but essentially there is one of our great streets over a kilometre closed to private vehicles. And Robert Adams was absolutely right. Absolutely right to convince me to do that and, and to reshape the centre of the city. But you've got to listen to the people who have the expertise. And they're not always the cheap solutions. Mm. I have great faith in Fisherman's Bend, partly because we have learned so much from the mistakes of Docklands. And, and we got that wrong for probably the first 10 years. And I understand the reasons why, but I remember going down there when I was first elected Lord Mayor and watching a rubbish truck pull up in the street and he picked up the rubbish bin from the street collection and went to empty it and there was nothing in it. Nothing in a rubbish bin mm. in the street. And that was demonstrative of the lack of life of people in Docklands because we hadn't made it friendly for people. And the big movement we're on now, and that's what will make Fisherman's Bend and Egate and eventually Docklands a success, is that you don't build great streets for buildings. You build it for people. And all the things that Ros was talking about are about building a city for people. And, and I couldn't agree more with that. We do slightly disagree on towers because there are, not everybody is a family of two with a Volvo station wagon and a golden retriever uh, and two children in <laughs> private schools, Ros. You're not looking <laughs> at <her. laughs> but, uh, but I think there is room, for, I love that idea that Fishman's Bend is not one uh, you know, homogeneous sort of mass that it's a series of small interlocking communities, each with their own character, and each working both individually and together. And, and that, to me, that granularity is where we need to land. Can I just make a comment on that too? Look, and I, and I, I agree with that. And I think that one of the, the, the values of Fisherman's Bend is that there's quite a deal of heritage in terms of industrial heritage. It may not be significant, it may not be a state significance, but there is fabric there that actually already creates a character and creates a quality. And the sense I'm getting is that Fisherman's Bend is a demolition and start from a blank canvas, when in actual fact Fisherman's Bend should be looking at quite a bit of that building stock and saying how can we actually convert that very quickly into accommodation, into small office suites, into studios, into opportunities for childcare facilities, etc. And I think we can do that. But at the moment, I think the culture of Fisherman's Bend, what, the, what I'm reading, is about demolish and rise from the ground. And I think that would be a great shame. Well, I, hope, I hope it's not. I agree with you. I think you, you need to reuse that existing mm. stock and, and repurpose mm. it. Um, when we looked at, and I know municipal rates are always really popular with people, but when we revalue every two years, we look very carefully at what's happened in various areas of the city. Because if we strike a rate base, it may unintentionally hurt a particular community. And the interesting thing to me last time, because we had a revaluation uh, over the, the New Year period, was that wh where did land values rise most steeply? It wasn't in East Melbourne and South Yarra. It was actually in North Melbourne. And the reason for that is exactly what Ros was talking about. These large warehouses or retail precincts are being captured and then converted, not knocked down, converted into residential and mixed use. And that's why the land values are rising so swiftly in places like West Melbourne, North Melbourne. And that's a good thing. You know, we're reusing the fabric that was once industrial in a city mm. for mixed use residential community purposes. And, and I think that is the way I'd love to see Fisherman's Bend develop. If you want to knock down one, that, that's Egate. That, they're the old rail yards up on the, uh, on the shoulder of, of Docklands down past uh, Channel 7 and Etihad over there. There's nothing there. That, that's where you can do that sort of rise from the ground stuff, but not Fisherman's Bend. We uh, mentioned already the value of diverse communities. I mean, I think it's a Christian principle that, that humans are best together in multi-age groups where there is diversity, uh, we live in places where, as we get older, we can still have the, uh, the sense of children being present. And I think from your straw poll just before, I, I'm suspecting, Ros, a lot of people here live in what we probably think is suburbia, which uh, in Melbourne is reasonably resistant to the kind of mixed-use diversity. Let's just talk through some of that. What, what, are, what, are some of the, what are some of the issues about, you know, broad Melbourne suburbia where there's good infrastructure, rail, tram... Uh, large blocks of land. What are the what are the opportunities 
that perhaps people who are here might have to trade off to have that kind of character of a, a diverse community where they mm. live. It's actually really important, Philip, because the Ministerial Advisory Committee, one of our fundamental strategic directions was to unlock the capacity of the established suburbs. That is, the suburbs which are rich in infrastructure and mm. rich in jobs. And in fact, more than 50% of the jobs are in the established middle suburbs at the moment. And what we're seeing is an increasing number of people moving cross town to access those jobs rather than this obsession with this radial movement where all roads lead to the CBD. Um, but the established suburbs, yes, um, have wonderful qualities and people are nervous about losing those qualities, losing that character, and they value it very much. Mm. And that's, um, I think, a, a great thing. They value the high streets and the main streets, which have been one of the great signatures of this city uh, and of the envy of other cities, that we do have these strip shopping centres that are full of vitality mm. and become community focuses. But can I say to you, let's, let's look at how we want to age in the local area and I think a lot of us need to have a serious think about this, that if we really have a strong social and community attachment and even a, a, a next of kin attachment to that suburb and we want to stay there but we're rattling around in the large family home, we've got our capital asset tied up in a piece of real estate and we're finding that we can't actually downsize into a smaller, mm. more uh, manageable, maintenance-free or less maintenance cost dwelling because we're not building it. And I think we need to come to terms with the fact that part of building suburbia, it doesn't stop in the 1960s or the 1980s. It has to evolve and actually provide the quality and, and diversity of, of housing to maintain people staying in those areas if they wish to. And we're not seeing that. The number of people in, in, uh, in places such as Hawthorne and Camberwell, um, even you know, Glen Iris, Surrey Hills, that would, I think, want to downsize into a smaller apartment with good security, perhaps with a courtyard, it might be a townhouse. It doesn't have to be a four-storey or six-storey building. I think there's an increasing number of us who are in that space. But if we don't provide that, if we don't plan for it, then we're going to sit in those houses rattling around until the day we die we're not going to release that real estate to the next group of families that want to come in and actually recycle that real estate. And we're not doing that. Why? Because we're not offering the choice for people to downsize. I mean, I think it's ludicrous that we have to pay stamp duty when we actually downsize. At the moment, you, you get an exemption from stamp duty if you're a first home buyer. If you're prepared to downsize, why shouldn't you get an exemption on stamp duty and enable you to actually live in a dwelling that's within your neighbourhood or your, your suburb but is smaller and meets your needs for that point in time and then enable your children, perhaps hopefully, to live close to where you live and your grandchildren. We're not doing it very well in the suburbs. We're doing, we're doing the opposite. We're, we're doing it appallingly. And it's all our fault. It's all your fault, okay? Let me, let me tell you why. The minister recently proposed new residential zones for our suburbs. And there is a very restrictive zone, which means that you can't make any alteration to it in the way that Ros has described. So what did all those bloody suburban councils do straight away? They listened to all of you. And they made the majority of their municipality this most restrictive zone. Think Brighton. Think Albert Park and South Melbourne. Think Camberwell and Hawthorne. And what they have done is lock their own children and grandchildren out of their suburb. That's when it will come home to roost in two generations time because they have locked those suburbs up in the most restrictive residential zoning possible because that's what their communities were clamoring for them to do. It's bad planning, bad social planning, bad town planning, and it's all because of the suburban clamour, and I have no patience with it. If you want to actually develop that, that diversity of housing, then you've got to say, okay, along tram lines and around train stations and around rail lines, we are going to have to have greater density. That will still leave the majority of the suburb untouched, 94% of the suburb untouched, but we're going to have to have four mm. storeys and six storeys along that existing infrastructure to make better use of it, to provide that diversity of housing and to get those extra people in. 
So I despair when I see sometimes the wider community offered a choice like that and we stampede to the most restrictive residential zoning possible because we believe we are protecting our suburb. We're doing exactly the opposite. And, and that, that makes me despair. Yeah, I, th I think this is really a serious issue and I know it's been mm. a very vexatious uh, issue in communities. It's really uh, got the angst up and the frustration and the concern from people. But um, I don't think we as planners have really communicated the narrative of housing need and life cycle change and what you look for at different stages in your life. So I think we as planners have failed in our communication and our messaging. Um, and I think that the politics of this has got in the way, unfortunately, rather than the public benefit. And I think that's uh, most unfortunate. You, you, you haven't communicated very well, but we as politicians have been craven. Absolutely cowardly and, and have buckled at so many local levels mm. to the voice of the moment rather than what we should be thinking the community of the future. Mm. You know, for the first time, we're starting to see a change where people are not thinking about what they want to live in, you know, a McMansion somewhere, don't care where, just somewhere, and rather thinking of how they wish to live and where they wish to live. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, I want my children to be buying houses in, you know, or, or renting, to be honest, in the next municipality or preferably in mine. Both my daughters have just bought houses. They're lucky enough to, to be able to do that in this market. And they've both bought in, in the West. You know, now the Westgate Bridge is not a, you know, not a terrible divider, but the funny part is they are starting their families in, in suburbs that are terrific and they enjoy. I'm not being snobbish about their suburb. But had they the choice, they would rather be in South Melbourne or Albert Park, close to their mother and to me, but they're not going to be. And, and that's the reality of us locking up these houses and therefore the steepling of prices in some, what have been very traditionally affordable suburbs, mm. no longer. Let, let's swing across to the, to the rental situation because I understand that 42% of families live in rental accommodation and um, Ros, you've got some ideas about how we, uh, we should renew the whole understanding of the, the, mm. the character of, of renting. Tell us a bit about that. Mm. The um, ABS figures came out um, a little while ago and uh, indicated across Victoria 42% of rental accommodation was couples and single parents, or couples with kids and single parents, um, which blew me away because uh, that's a, a really substantial figure of uh, families um, in rental accommodation. Now, um, I think we are moving into a different paradigm in terms of ownership, um, house uh, family, sorry, dwelling ownership. I think we're going to see an increasing number of people either out of necessity or out of choice actually choosing rental um, and having that income uh, that's left over to do other things, which is very much the European model um, of how people live within, uh, within cities they largely rent. But the problem we've got here is that we've got short-term tenure, that most people can only get a 12-month lease. Whereas in other parts of the world, you can get leases from up anything from two to three years up to much longer periods of time, and you negotiate that with the landlord or landlady at, at, at that point in time. The good thing about that is if we could actually start to get a minimum rental agreement arrangement in terms of time, it means that certainly for families, as the rent changes, they don't have to necessarily leave that premises and move elsewhere and possibly take their kids out of school. And that's what's happening, particularly for single parents. The advice I'm getting is that a lot of single parents in rental accommodation uh, are living very much on the margin in terms of their household budget. Um, and when the rent goes up, even a small increase in rent, they are forced to move somewhere else and take the kids out of school, which is a huge mm. social disruption. That's something that none of us would like to see. So I would like to see some fairly substantial changes in the rental agreement arrangements in this state um, and that we accept that we're going to have an increasing number of people who will be renters rather than owners. Um, but at the same token, I don't think that's a bad thing, but I do think they need security of tenure and I think they're entitled to it. The other thing is that if you give them reasonably good security of tenure and you include in that some sort of maintenance agreement where they take on some of the maintenance cost, um, 
you can build that into the rental structure so that they actually become uh, good carers and, and maintainers of your asset. Whereas at the moment, if it's a 12-month situation, which it is in the majority of cases, you will often see that people are not prepared to maintain those premises, not even paint the walls, because the tenure period is so small. Mm. These big questions um, about infrastructure, I know the Council's been involved in some, I think, quite innovative redevelopment uh, where there's been obligations for the developers to put um, social infrastructure in, capacities for schools, community things. Robert, just tell us uh, the, the levers that, that exist for us to get more sustainable and better outcomes. If everything is horse trading. You know, um, the example Philip talks about, when you're going out of the city on King's Way at, at some point, as you go through um, the casino there, look down on City Road and you'll see the old Boyd School. It's, it's a beautiful old Victorian school. We bought that and we renovated the school as a library and community centre and some creative spaces for artists. So there's a bit of you know, life in that building. Then we went to the market and we said, we'll give you some height here, you can build on one third of the site residential apartments, but we want you to do three things. Number one, we want you to partner with an affordable housing uh, provider and, we, and I need you to provide, and it was about 10% uh, of, of the number of uh, houses as affordable housing, but you need to partner with a reputable and, and known housing provider, affordable housing provider. Number two, you need to partner with a disability group, and, and you need to provide another 10% of your apartments to people with disabilities. Um, they, they did that, I, I forget, it's not Housing Choices, but it's one of the affordable housing providers, uh, and... Uh, MS and people living with an acquired brain injury. So 20% of the apartments are given over to those people and you have to landscape the open space of a third of that site. And by the way, they will pay me $8 million. So for $12 million of outlay, that's the outcome we've got in terms of community asset, open space, affordable housing, diversity of housing. And by the way, we had four viable tenderers for that project. And increasingly, that's what we've got to do. We've got to look at smart ways of integrating those people that otherwise will be left behind. And, and Ros has just given me an idea. I'm not quite sure how I could do it, but maybe in the next one we do, we should ask for affordable rental, long-term premises. But that, that's actually a very good idea. And the next one will be probably down uh, at the redevelopment of Queen Victoria Market. So I think there are models that... And, and I don't think that's particularly magic that... You know, the city partners with private enterprise, partners with, you know, uh, charitable and, and other providers, and by the way, provides open space. And yet that little model, I've, I've been asked, to, I've, I've talked about it at the OECD, I've talked about it in Chicago, I've talked about it in, in London, and people look at you like you're mad. And, and then they suddenly think, you know something, that's a very powerful mechanism. And, and if you can do that, then what's left behind is actually a very good coherent product that much better reflects our community than if we just let the market to decide. So I think there are methodologies like that where as a local authority or, or as a state government or to be honest as a federal government, you, you can look for, and, and the key word here is partnerships. You know, you don't see the private sector as the enemy uh, against whom you have an adversarial battle, an arm wrestle to see who's going to come out on top and, and you don't see the uh, charitable and the not-for-profit uh, sector as, you know, the poor whom we must lift up. Uh, you know, you, you actually look at how we can partner together for good results for all. Mm. Now, we're actually pretty good at that in Melbourne. We're pretty, if you think about a number of the organisations that, that you belong to and think about the partners that you have in order to make it work really well, and I reckon we do it very well here. So to me, that's, that's the way forward. It's not saying it's all the public sector, or let me the other order. It's the private sector, and then the public sector will pick up what they can, and then the churches, charitables, philanthropics, and other organisations will scoop up the rest. It's not that anymore. It's saying, how can we work together in order to give a good result for all? And, and I think the Boyd School example and potentially the Queen Victoria Market uh, redevelopment may well be models that, that we look at. We, we did it with QV, the development uh, on the corner of Lonsdale and Swanson Street. Rather than just leaving that to a developer, 
we actually bought the site. We didn't want to be developers ourselves, but then what we did was invite in the partners we wanted to deliver the open space we needed, the diversity of built form, um, the, the parking that we needed, and, and then left it to the private sector to do it for us. But the partnership was with us. And I think that's increasingly the way we will go. But Ros's conversation precedes that. Where is it that we want to land with these partnerships? What sort of communities do we want to build? And, and then let's look at what partnership will deliver that. Well, let's, okay. let's, op let's open things up for the broader conversation. And there'll be some can chance I, can to I just, think. Can well, I just raise something with that, if I may? <laughs> um, I think you're going to. We, <laughs> well, well, I'd just like to build on that, because I think they're terrific initiatives, and it shows local government leading, and leadership is part of the story, I think. Mm. But can I say, we've got a vast resource called public land, and at the moment, government is selling public land. There's quite a number of schools that are being mm. sold at the moment. Why are we not ensuring that before we sell those schools, in the expressions of interest that go out to the marketplace, we are saying, as part of you tendering, you are required to provide X number of affordable or social housing units in this redevelopment. You're required to provide perhaps a childcare facility or a community facility, or perhaps some public open space. But making it very clear at the outset, before the market actually tenders for that piece of land, or that, that asset, they know what the ground rules are and what the expectation is on the delivery. We are not doing that. We are just putting it out to the market and getting the highest and best price rather than actually sweating those assets and making them work for us in terms of delivering some of the public benefits that we expect we would get out of selling a public asset. And developers say to me, if we know the ground rules at the beginning, before we purchase the land, we'll do the FISOs, we'll work out how much we can pay for the land, and then if we think there's a buck in it, we'll then put our hand up mm. and bid for it. And if we don't think there's a dollar in it, we won't play the game. We are not doing that. We are not being smart mm. about how we sell those public assets and build the next generation of resources and housing that we so desperately need. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's open it up now for um, your interaction. First question is, why do we still not have a rail out to the airport? And another one just is, Federation Square has been a wonderful opportunity to bring people back to the cities. Um, Burke Street Mall, Swanson Street, I think, you know, you're right, you've got cars off there, but we still have these things that we say are, what, 100, rhinoceros 100 rhinoceroses heavy that rattle down there. And I still don't see people really embracing, you know, when you think of great European cities, you've got these spaces where you can just wander. Um, Mayor Dole, when you were talking about the cranes and the, the relation to economic growth, um, something called the paradox of thrift, like Lord Cairns meant and has been known that as people stop consuming that we have a downturn in the economy. But at the moment we have a huge sustainability problem. Um, I'm looking at um, urban design subjects this semester and sustainable, sustainability hasn't really been a strong point in Melbourne, uh, can, is there, uh, like something like San Francisco has an eco-districts um, program, is there room for um, doing something like that, establishing eco-districts eco in um, public land and then from them using tactical urbanism to push sustainability outwards? Um, thank you very much for the range of ideas that you presented to us, but uh, with respect, um, I indicate that perhaps a lot of this is aspirational, and if anyone here has somehow or other been unfortunate enough to be involved in a planning appeal, how do you redress the inequality and imbalance in bargaining power if you're an individual citizen in a neighbourhood with that of the developer? Because you can't match their economic clout when it gets down to the, the matter of an, a planning appeal. How do you redress that inequality? Well, um, on the airport link, um, I have to be convinced that it's, it's, it's financially viable. I'll, I'll be quite pragmatic about this. Uh, we know that the Sydney airport link isn't making money. We know the Brisbane airport link isn't making money. So I have to ask myself the question, is the Melbourne airport link going to make money or even break even? And I think that it requires a very 
transparent business case process to deal with it. So I reserve my judgment until I actually see the business case that demonstrates that yes, it's viable, because at the moment I question whether it is viable. Now, the other thing about the airport link is that it's all about getting people to and from the airport, particularly the business sector. There's a lot of talk about, you know, we've got to do business and, and you can't have business people sitting in traffic for an hour getting to and from the airport. And any of us who've gone to the airport during the peak periods know that, you know, you have to triple the time uh, in your mind as to how long it's going to take you to get there um, because you can't be guaranteed that you're going to get there on time. But I'm a great believer in the Skybus. I think the Skybus has been a ter terrific initiative and it's affordable. But the problem with the Skybus is we don't prioritise it on the freeway. We actually put it in the mix with everybody else and so out of the peak periods it struggles to actually compete. Um, and I'd much rather see improvements in that sort of form of getting people to the airport. And in addition, I hope none of you live in Rosanna, but I'm a great supporter of the missing link in the outer ring road that is connecting up the western ring road with east link and i think that if we did that then we'd have a lot of people who would be using that as the major route to get to the airport rather than this obsession with coming into the city getting on the tullamarine and then going out you know um, it's a triangle and i was always taught it's quicker to go that way than that way so i think that we need to start thinking about the airport access from a different perspective, and that is completing the Metropolitan Road Network and ensuring that that gets people from the eastern and southeastern suburbs to the airport, because they're the main ones who I think are experiencing the problem. Let me have a, a quick quack at the whole lot. Um, I don't think it'll be a business case. 31 million people used our airport in the last year. In 15 years' time, the third runway will be built because we're getting a third one east-west, yeah. and 51 million people will be using that airport. So a link will be absolutely crucial, because Skybus and the road network, even with that connector, which I agree with, won't service it. So that will be the imperative that, that drives it. Sorry about Swanson Street, I can't take trams out of the busiest tram route in the world, uh, but maybe we could think about giving a Swanson-style treatment to Elizabeth Street, and, and even the RACV agrees with that. So I think it's more about shifting the balance rather than getting trams out of there as well. We're going to have to share space in the hollow grid. It, it won't be like a European-style cobblestone wanderabout city. I can't agree with you on sustainability. We do have a precinct. It's called Docklands. Mm. It, it has more six-star, green-star buildings than any other postcode in Australia. You know, we have a program to retrofit 1,200 buildings uh, around the city to at least four and a half neighbours. You know, the older building stock, the C&D stuff. We've done 563 of them, a project that's won awards around the world. If you look at our stormwater harvesting, you know, Fitzroy Gardens, Birrarung Ma, Queen Victoria Gardens, you know, now 30% of our water is provided through that stormwater harvesting. Have a look at any, come, come to any planning session at council and you'll see us horse trading higher levels of sustainability, particularly around waste, the, to trade off against greater density. The area where I don't think we get it right in the city, where we're very bad, is waste. You know, and, and even terrible, you know, not terrible cities, it's an awful thing to say, Robert, sorry. I've been on a 16-lane freeway in Sao Paulo, crossing over a 24-lane freeway. Not a very pleasant city to be in. I wanted to go out to dinner and they said, sure, just wait till we organise the armed guard for you. But that city does waste to energy better than any city I've seen because it was a necessity for them to do it. And I think we could do much better there. So I can't agree that we're terrible at sustainability. I, I think we have some exemplar projects, but we've got a fair way to go. VCAT, we do about 1,000 uh, a year in terms of approvals. Everything from the very large right down to the very small neighbourhood one. Around 5% of those finish up in VCAT. And of the ones that finish up in VCAT where council supports it, we win 90% of them. If you're on the pointy end, then, you know, I'm sorry, it's just an awful experience. I remember when VCAP was set up, and I was in government at the time, I remember the then attorney promising that this would not be the place for expensive legal battles where the ordinary folk would come and plead their case. Well, there are now QCs who, who've, you know, got silk by having a practice nowhere but VCAT. So I think it's kind of lost its way. I think the future there is not VCAT. I think the future for planning is in mediation. 
rather than in a judicial system which VCAT has become. And, and that's where I hope uh, those sorts of planning disputes will now go because that's a far better outcome than, than a you know, winner takes all in, in VCAT situation. But for the people who lose out in VCAT at the moment, it's a very, very bruising experience and an expensive one. Can I just raise on VCAT, because I spent 30 years as an expert witness at VCAT as well as doing advocacy work, and I was probably one of the few planning consultants who would actually work as an advocate for third party objectors, okay? Most of my colleagues in consultancy wouldn't touch you because, you know, they just weren't in that space. But I used to have conversations with those objectors and sit down and have a pretty hard line approach. I would say to them at the outset, no, you don't have a case if I didn't believe you had a case. I think you need to know that at the outset, you know, rather than going in and then finding that it's very time consuming, it's costly and it causes a lot of anxiety. So I believe that if you're going to seek advice, then make sure you get someone who's going to be pretty honest and frank with you whether you've got a case or not. And unfortunately, I don't think the lawyers do that very well and I don't think planning consultants who act as advocates are very honest with third parties when it comes to that very crucial initial discussion. In terms of VCAT, yes, I agree. I like to keep people out of VCAT. I don't like the adversarial side of the planning profession. I find it very destructive and divisive and it, do it doesn't build a good feel for the profession. It's very much, you know, something that a lot of people don't like planners because we happen to be on the other side. But can I say to you too that VCAT's got a pretty tough job and they are required to weigh up what I call some fairly competing and conflicting interests. And sometimes, yes, they will make a determination that isn't in your interest and in other cases they will. And there is no sure way of guaranteeing that you're going to be a winner or a loser in that forum. But I believe with the negotiation and mediation process, I think whatever you sh we should be doing and developers should come to the party and actually sit down and mediate and negotiate. And some do it very well and they're very sincere about it in my experience, but there are others who just say, I want to get on with the job and get to the end of the process. So I believe in negotiation and mediation, but I, I think VCAT's job is a really tough gig and a lot of people, you know, if they don't get what they want, then they lay aspersions on VCAT and I think, well, let's be fair to VCAT, they've done the best they can. Just to um, comment on the, the question of sustainability, I think we have to do sustainability better and more comprehensively uh, in that we've heard that um, really it's, it's a lot has, of, of the success of our society is about still anticipating growth, building things and, and, and that kind of that position of growth. Um, I think we haven't actually really reached that point where we know what doing sustainability better is like, but I think we've touched on some of it in working um, you know, in, with, with a light hand to make communities more diverse, being open to those things rather than just uh, uh, you know, a, a plain uh, you know, knock down things, put up a duplex, people take some profit out of it. And I think we may in, in fact need models where uh, there is um, a sharing of, of economic resource and economic benefit, say between people uh, who, who want to exit uh, a big suburban house and a big house block and, uh, and the people who want to enter as uh, younger, younger people or the people who would like to go into more downsized retirement accommodation so that we, we actually find economic models where people share that benefit. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, a bit more expansive than what we've got, but I know there's some more questions, Chris, that people want to open up to. Just a, a quick anecdote. Yesterday I was uh, in Ingalls Street waiting for the transfer station to open and uh, just next door I was actually quite horrified to see that there's factories being uh, bulldozed right at the moment. There's vast open spaces being created. So with the kind of questions we're talking about this morning are uh, right on our doorstep, you know, and the, the factories not being reused. They're just being bowled over. And, uh, massive sort of areas that look like dirt playing fields. I just, and, and the other comment I just want to make, uh, yesterday someone was telling me that it looks like schools, vertical schools look like they're going to be um, more prevalent in this new area than open, open sort of spaces and I, I think there's some, some real dangers and some alerts, alarms going off in my head about, about that. I'd be interested in your comments. 
Thank you. It seems to me a, a false assumption that you build along railway lines and tram lines that people actually use the facilities and there is insufficient parking. They're going to have cars, even if they do use public transport. That's a, a terrible problem. And the other thing is on forward planning. I guess when, East, when Elizabeth Street, Richmond was built, or the Atherton Gardens in Fitzroy, we looked at them in horror. You would look at the Atherton Gardens now and think, how, how delightful. Green spaces, barbecue, you know, their vegetable plot, their pizza oven. A terrific. I'd, I'd live there in preference to Docklands any day. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to ask about affordable rental. Uh, we have just started it since, but we had Collingwood Towers where uh, people with jobs like uh, train and tram drivers and conductors lived. We don't seem to have that anymore, whereas in Austria and Germany, Hundertwasser house, houses were built to provide dignified and distinctive housing to poor people. If we don't provide that kind of accommodation, where are the people who take out the first train going to live? Why don't we have that as part of their employment contract? And what can we do to make sure that we do have that affordable rental? Um, let me have a, a crack first. Um, Ray, look, you're, you're right. The school planned for Montague Street in South Melbourne is a vertical school. And uh, uh, it, it will be an experiment. It works elsewhere in the world, but I'm not quite sure that, that you know, how it will go here. I'm, I'm a little ambivalent about it. I, I must say, and in, in our area, I look at Albert Park Primary School, and you kind of feel ashamed to be part of this generation. You look at what our forefathers built, this, this beautiful brick Victorian building, and then their sons built a beautiful Edwardian brick hall, and then even in the 70s and 80s, there's a, a solid brick addition and, and what's the addition of our generation to that school? A two-storey portable, which seems to me to be a contradiction in terms. So I'm a little unsure about it. I'm, I'm so angry about that demolition, let me tell you. I, I was in Tianjin in China recently, and they were keeping a major factory, an old sawtooth factory, and converting it to housing. And the mayor very proudly told me that's what he'd seen happening in Melbourne. So when we're not even doing what they're doing in Tianjin, and they're using our model, something's wrong with the world. Um, I can promise you that that intensification along railway lines does work. Um, they often don't have cars, you're quite right. It's not for everybody, but if you want to see an area where it, it's, it's not perfect, but where it, it is sort of a model, it's the bottom of Swanson Street opposite the University of Melbourne. And if you look at the other side, you'll see the, the shops and, and the little retail outlets, and behind that, only one building thick, a range of buildings, not all of them attractive buildings by any means, between four and ten storeys tall. And, and they, they do use the footpaths, the cycle path, the public transport, and, and they, they tend not to have cars. So, you know, it, it's not for everybody, but, but I promise you it, it does work. The answer to your question is, this is a problem that we are facing. Affordable rental used to be called public housing. Public housing is now in gridlock. There, there isn't, you know, we... we we made up our minds a long time ago that public housing was a house for life, not a turnover and re-entry into the private market. And, and that's probably the right social answer, but what it means is it locks it up. The private market is getting ever more expensive because of the cost of property. So I think the only answer to your question is what Ros was talking about before, and perhaps some intervention in the market by levels of government like us to provide affordable rental. And I think it's a really interesting model. And if there's one thing I'll take away from this morning and, and go back and with... Uh, they, they hate it at the city when I come back with an enthusiasm. They think, oh, God, no. <laughs> I, either three months of trying to reverse engineer and talk him out of it or in the end just do it, it's easier. But, but I, think that, I think it is a wonderful model. And I'm, I'm going to take that back and look at an affordable rental model for the Queen Victoria market redevelopment in particular. Uh, and I think it's something that we haven't really thought of here, but we could. And, and it is an answer to a problem where people are falling between that, that gap of public and private markets. Can, can I just comment on the, uh, a couple of things? On the uh, accommodation, rental accommodation, um, it is really important that people who work in the emergency services sector uh, have access to where they work as quick as possible. You know, paramedics, 
firefighters, uh, ambulance drivers, nurses, um, the people who are the basic building blocks of our, our overall care and well-being, we should be able to ensure that they have access to accommodation that is close to their workplace and they should be privileged in the system, I believe, to be able to be provided with that. And we haven't done that, but I think through various interventionist um, mechanisms in the marketplace, which hopefully someone's got the courage to do, we can, we can start to provide them with that sort of accommodation because to me it's a no-brainer. Uh, you don't want um, a paramedic travelling two hours to get to work. I mean, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, on the car parking side of it, look, um, I, it's interesting because we're seeing a demographic of young people who don't have cars. Um, and if you go, and at some of the survey work that's been done on, on apartment buildings in the inner suburbs, um, looking at the reduction in car ownership, and it's quite substantial, um, and it is mainly the Y generation um, the kids in their 20s and early 30s uh, who are deciding they don't need a car so long as they can live close to public transport and they're prepared to use a go-share car or a go-get car on the, on the street or, you know, to, for friends to get together if they've got one car. So I think we are seeing a change in that culture in terms of car ownership, which I think is really good. Um, and hopefully that's ending up with more people walking, cycling and using PT. On the vertical schools, I'm actually a bit of a fan of the vertical schools. Why? Because I actually see them as a life learning hub. I don't see them as a primary school or a secondary school. I actually see them as a learning hub where it becomes a 24-7 facility. And at the moment, we don't sweat our schools as much as we could in terms of that major capital infrastructure. I think it is important to maintain the open space and recreation space, but that can be a shared facility in that vertical format. And I think it does um, make us think differently about how we educate and how we build for education and how those buildings become adaptable to how our education and training needs change. And they will change quite substantially over the next few decades. Thank, thanks very much for your participation this morning. You can see this is a, a really big area that does affect a lot of our personal self-interest, the whole question about the, the neighbourhoods we live in, how they are going to be sustainable beyond our lifetime and, and, and economically diverse, diverse in age and experience of people. And uh, uh, you've heard some pretty strong views being expressed. And Ros, I'm grateful for your, your contribution, both professionally and, and here at this discussion this morning, because I, I think you can, you can see we are talking about time frames that in our, our modern understanding of our values system really go beyond uh, almost our attention span, you know, to have a 40-year plan of how things might develop with incremental policies and people holding a consistency of things that, that add up to uh, what will be a great, a great and sustainable city in 40 or 50 years' time uh, is, is possibly reasonably un uncommon in the way we, uh, we've sort of become very uh, short-termed and, and short in our cycles. So I think we've opened those questions up well this morning. Thank you for those who've interacted from our audience. And would you join me now as I just close in a prayer for our city, uh, because uh, Christians are always encouraged to pray for the, the good of those with whom we live. Loving God, we thank you that uh, we have people who are making these long-term plans for the good of our city. We pray that all who work to help our cities be sustainable, to be rich, to be livable, to be places of harmony and uh, real places of community can prosper in their work. Give us the understanding of those issues that where we need personal choice to make good decisions about our role in the development of those policies and guide all who are in positions of responsibility, those who in all sorts of uh, even invisible ways make our cities work and, and help us be enriched in our participation in the cities wherever we live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.